um welcome everyone and good night i don't know uh, i am in berlin it's already 9 p.m here but most of you probably not well anyway good night or good afternoon <laughs> Mm, this is a event that's part of the Futures Literacy Summit. It's an um, uh, event that was created by UNESCO and UNESCO invited many um, foresight institutes to talk about future literacy and how to think about futures. And, and then we, we thought it would be a very interesting subject to make one table about the future of death. Um, Envisioning is a foresight institute that combines data visualization with mapping of emerging technologies. Uh, we are a distributed group of people from many places and all over the world. And uh, during the summit, we'll be hosting many events around 20, I think, among master classes, workshops, roundtables. And I'm super happy to, to present this, this one. And let me introduce Bibiana. Bibiana Heigert, she is the one that will be moderating the talk today, and she's a climate crisis communicator. She holds a master in environmental issues, and she's the author of the Climax newsletter for the climate crisis. Welcome, Bibiana, and everyone. And <laughs> then she will. There. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to thank everyone from, for being here, all our panelists and everyone watching us. Um, it's a great group. I'm really happy about it. Me and Carol really wanted to talk about the subject and bring it to light. And um, I believe that 2020 will forever be linked to death. Uh, in the past months, we've gotten used to counting our dead daily. And this enhanced but not irrational fear of death has kept some of us in our houses and has taken others to the streets to reclaim their rights not to be killed. Uh, somehow, something as certain as death seems to have caught us by surprise. Somehow, death is something we're never prepared for. But we should no longer neglect death as we imagine the future. And to do so, the first step is to talk about it, which is what we want to do today, to look at death from different angles and imagine new ways to confront it in the days to come. Can death be changed? We have a panel of five amazing thinkers that will discuss the subject through the perspective of their diverse set of expertise. So I want to start with um, short introductions um, about uh, each one of them. And then um, they will give their a short presentation of their views on the theme and will follow with an open discussion, likely guided by me. And in the end, we'll open for uh, questions from everyone in the audience. So I'll start by calling um, each one of them in alphabetical order to answer, um, to say uh, what they think about the future of that. So we will start with Dr. Aubrey the Gray. I'm so sorry I <laughs> said your name wrong before. I really apologize. So Dr. Aubrey de Grey is a biomedical gerontologist, the chief science officer of SENS. Is that how I pronounce it? Yeah. SENS yeah. Research Foundation, a biomedical research charity that performs and funds laboratory research dedicated to combating aging. And he's also the editor in chief of Rejuvenation Research. So welcome Dr. Gray, thank you for being here. Could you tell us how do you envision death by, let's say, 2050? Well, thank you very, very much for having me. It's great to speak to this audience. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, how do I envision death in 2050? Well, of course, whenever we answer a question that has a year in it that is in the distant future, even 10 years away, let alone 30 years away, we always have to preface our answers with and uh, with a you know stressing how speculative and probabilistic what we're going to say is um so of course i don't know but i would say that with at least 50 percent probability everything i'm going to say will actually be true by 2050. so i'm going to say there won't be much death by 2050. um i think that we will have had by that time at least 10 or 15 years to uh, basically to perfect 
and implement and of course distribute medicines that bring the main cause of death under control, namely, of course, aging. When I say under control, I do not mean simply keeping people alive in a poor state of health. That is something that actually probably will never happen, not only because we don't really want it, but because it is technically far more difficult than keeping people youthful in the first place. So we will be seeing a great deal less death from aging at that point. And my take is that partly because we will have had such success against aging, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> we will also see a great acceleration in our ability to reduce death from causes that do not have to do with how long ago you were born, or at least not so much to do with it. So infectious diseases, uh, road accidents, asteroids, you know, all of these things. So my sense is that we will actually not have much death by then. That is a very good perspective. Um, so let's see our next guest, um, Dr. Erica Borgstrom. Um, thank you for being here. Um, she's a lecturer in medical anthropology and end of life care at the Open University in the United Kingdom where she leads open panopology. She's also the co-editor of the journal Mortality. And her research uses anthropological skills to disrupt the normative concepts in end-of-life care by foregrounding people's everyday experiences and the structural and discursive elements that shape how care is provided. So hi, Erica, welcome. And um, how do you see the future of that? Yeah, I would say I'm maybe not as optimistic as you are, Aubrey. <laughs> um, for me, I guess thinking about the future of death is also thinking about the future of dying. And of course, maybe that's a bit biased because of my research area in end-of-life care, but we know death is a process. And I've been uh, studying end-of-life care in the UK for about the last 10 years, particularly looking at when palliative care is involved in people's care and encouraging them to do what's called advanced care planning, where they're trying to get patients and those around them to think about the kinds of care and treatment they might want in their last year of life. So when I think about what the future of death and dying might be like, I find it useful to think about what's currently happening, where there might be trends in sort of end of life care and tension points that might need uh, sorting out if we want certain optimistic ways of, of improving dying as it goes on. Uh, can't cover all of them at the moment, but a few that stick out to me is, there's an increasing amount of biomedical interventions that people are experiencing across their life course. Now for many of us, not maybe an optimistic 2050 that we just heard, that means that we're living longer, but actually maybe accumulating multiple morbidities, multiple diseases as we age. And we know statistically at the moment, people who have more of those diseases tend to have poor quality of life later in life and also need quite a lot of biomedical intervention or treatments and, and have a lot of treatment in their last year of life. So they tend to have a lot, a lot of treatment. What's happening in places like in the UK is there's a policy push to encourage more planning ahead for that last year of life, anticipating that you'll have these treatment decisions to be making and to get people to think about what kind of treatments they do or do not want and to get palliative care professionals on board and other professionals, health, usually biomedical healthcare professionals on board to encourage people to think about what they want. But we know that dying can sometimes be unpredictable. And so what we see at the moment happening is palliative care encourages a sort of parallel planning on one side, they plan for an idealized good death where we can kind of control and manage that dying process, manage people's symptoms. And they're also planning for the unpredictable declines that can happen for people, even if they're being cared for in a hospital or in their home or a care home or a hospice, and also the crises in care that can happen because healthcare involves people, like it, we need each other to look after ourselves. So that raise, rises lots of tensions around how and when these decisions should be made, who should be making them. And currently the policy push is putting a lot on the individual patients to be thinking about what they want. But ethnographically, when we study how people are making decisions, they're making them much more relationally, thinking about what does my spouse need? What do my kids need? What do my pets need from me? And how do I make decisions about my dying in relation to those other people? And also there are a lot of structural issues that affect how and what people can have in terms of care and the decisions they can make. So how realistic it is to um, 
create the decision you want in practice. So when I look at the future of 2050, I think there's gonna be a push for people thinking more about the dying they wanna have, but it will need to acknowledge that there's a lot of complexity in what that dying might look like in terms of the different treatments, thinking about how and when people are dying, if we give full choice in terms of assisted dying in different places, and also thinking about how we need to equip people to make those decisions, as well as change our systems to acknowledge that it's rarely individuals making decisions about their own care, but a much more relational way of thinking about death and dying. So that's how I see it going. Like I said, not as optimistic about immortality. Well, that's why we're here. We want different opinions and different uh, ways to look at this uh, question. So this is great. Thank you very much. Um, so next we have Dr. Gillian Tellis, um, an associate professor in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of San Diego. Her teaching and research interests focus on health communication, specifically communication about dying and death. Tellis scholarship used qualitative methods to study such topics as uh, hospice, team communication, tumor boards, spirituality, dying, death, quality of life, and a good death. So welcome, Jillian, um, and thank you for being here. Could you share with us your view on this subject? Thank you for having me. I knew as soon as I was going to be introduced, the dogs would start barking. So I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, Erica is actually, your, her opening was a great uh, setup for some of the things that I think of when I think of the, the future of death. Um, I'll just say a little bit first about kind of how I approach this topic because I, I, I think it's useful for people to understand that um, as a communication scholar, I'm interested in language, I'm interested in messages, I'm interested in, and specifically for my work because I do ethnographic and qualitative work, I'm very much interested in seeing how communication unfolds in real time in the actual settings where these conversations like Erica is describing are taking place. And what I'm interested in, part of the reason why I think this is important and I want to kind of lead with this a little bit is to say that how we talk about these issues construct a particular reality for uh, all of us. And so um, for me, I really think of this topic as, um, it, it, for me, it's important to embrace the idea that death is a natural part of life. And so my goal is not necessarily, and my interests aren't necessarily to um, in, into the future. So it's an interesting panel for me to be a part of because I'm thinking about what we're doing in the here and now and sometimes looking back to the past to think about how that is informing the present. But when I think about what we could be doing uh, moving into the future, I think that um, you know, death education and death literacy um, would really be an important step because I think death is inevitable. Even if we expand the lifespan, I think ultimately it will end in the end, the end of our lives will eventually come. Um, for me, I have spent a lot of time thinking about this concept of a good death. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of wholeheartedly embraced this when I was a young scholar. I took, you know, the kind of hospice perspective about a, a death that was you know, pain-free and, you know, both existentially pain-free and, and physically free of pain. Um, but over the years, and maybe as I've, I've become more of an independent thinker, um, I, I have been and, and spent more, had more experiences, I've really come to question this idea about what a good death is, perhaps because life, um, life, I just, in fact, I just read that the World Health Organization, um, some of their data just came out that said people are living longer. Life expectancy around the globe has increased from 67 to 73 years, but only five of those years have at, were actually in good health. So I start thinking about the, those issues like quality of life versus quantity of life. I start thinking about who is invited to contribute to the conversation about what constitutes a good death, whose values are represented in this, this idea, this kind of aspirational idea. And I think what, when we start asking those types of questions, I think that what we find is that sometimes people of color, poor people, um, disabled people, um, you know, people who um, are from the LGBT community, some, perhaps their values are not represented in what might constitute a good death. And what does that mean? And then we can start asking questions also about what a good life looks like, because um, many people will observe that 
you can, you know, um, not everybody has maybe equal opportunity to live to be 67 or 73. Um, and especially here in the United States where we um, are really starting to ask questions, I think about what types of things are necessary for people to even have a good death. Can we even have that conversation if police brutality is a factor, if access to clean food, you know, clean water, clean air, um, good food systems, uh, healthcare, right? If those basic elements of, of life are not present, how can we even begin to have a conversation about that good death question? But ultimately, I think um, for me, uh, uh, just as a wrapping up point, um, when I think about what types of things are happening in this moment that I think will be projected into the future is I think that we're gonna, we're gonna see, I think more of a death positive kind of movement. Like I think that's gonna start, can, I think that will continue, it's happening now. And I think it will continue. I think for some people that have access, um, you know, we will see uh, things like death doulas becoming, you know, even more prominent in our culture for, pe again, for people who can afford to access that type of care. And I think, you know, in light of um, some of the things that are happening uh, with, with the pandemic, the kind of global pandemic, I think we're going to start thinking more about grief also and thinking about grief as a public health issue. Um, so those are just a few of the things that I, that I think of when I think of uh, kind of the future of death in, uh, you know, perhaps even around the globe, not just here in, in the U.S. where I am. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to talk to Monica. Um, Monica, and I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong. Is Bilskita? Is that how you say it? Well, Monica, could we, could we keep myself? Could we keep myself last? Because we agreed that I will go last one to do kind oh. of the the sum up. Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't know. I'm so sorry. Um, I guess. I Thank will, you so much. That's that. Are you okay with that, um, Doctor Natasha? Uh, certainly, I will graciously <laughs> oblige. <laughs> okay. I was just, I was relaxing and listening and gathering my thoughts together because um, I didn't think that would affect, but so Well, great. so let me present to you first um, Dr. Natasha Vito Moore, who is known for being the co-founder of the transhumanism humanist movement. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> introducing the seminal field of human enhancement for longevity in academics and developing the theory of the regenerative generation. She is also a professor of technology, innovation, and ethics. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed everyone's presentation. Your um, provocations are, are, are rich and ripe and I could respond to each one, but I need to stay on track. So that's a little bit of a struggle. The answer to the question, how do you envision death and dying by the year 2050? I'll make two points. The criteria or condition for death will be more rigorously redefined. Living or not living is not an either or people will want a body for living rather than a body for aging and death. Now, with that said, let me do a little bit of a deep dive, but not too deep because I wanna keep this as cogent as possible. First, the term death will be rigorously redefined based on the conditions and criteria of death. What is often called death or dead will become reversible through nanomedicine, for example, and other molecular uh, mitigations to intervening with the processes of death and injury. The conditions for death will separate the clinically dead from those who are candidates for that reversible death, let's say. Now, this can be overturned. So there is a difference between death and dead. Dead is lack of existence, it's gone, it's dark, it's the end. But dying, as we've already discussed, and I, I think it was Erica who uh, defined this very cautiously and carefully for us, that it's a process, a set of processes. And by this, the associated processes of death are not the final stage of being dead. And I think that's something we must pay attention to. 
because we've learned over the eons that we thought someone was dead when they weren't dead. People were buried with a bell outside their grave to ring if they regain consciousness. And we know we can restart hearts and we can bring people back. So that is a given that's understood. It's not any type of pseudoscience or hyperbole, it's medical science in fact. But we need to stretch that out a little bit. And based on the advances in medical science and technology and the ethical uses of the same, we need to be aware and awake to how these changes are affecting us on a socioeconomic political platform. The second part of that first part is that a person may want to take a leave of absence from living. Say you live 70 years, 90 years, 120, 200 years, you might want to take an absence. So how are we going to look at that? What might that be like in 2050? 2050 is 30 years away. So if we look at the past 30 years and look at the past 100 years, the rate of, of change has made us extremely uncomfortable, but that uncomfortableness of change has made us more awake and made us more ardent in learning and uncovering and discovering. So terms such as life pause, for example, um, could create in-between states for living, um, stages where a person may want to drop out for a while from living and take a breather and then jumpstart time once again. This alternative to actively living to um, add that in between state could provide a type of vacation or a respite from living. Now that might sound strange, but just think about it for a moment. If we wanna drop out of certain environments that we're in. If we look at the idea of retirement and um, certain claims of what is normal and abnormal, it has certainly changed over the past 50 years, over the past 100 years, and over the past hundreds of years, the, the changes to human nature based on normalcy or normal cannot be stopped. And we need to be accepting of that. The second point I wanna make is that the environment of life needs to be addressed. That humans and other life forms uh, will no longer be binary. And by this, I mean, there's not gonna be you're either alive or you're dead. There'll be those in between stages. And these only two choices seem so obfuscated of our psychology and the way we understand the world around us today. We don't have just one relationship or just one job. There's not just two genders. There is a myriad of changes that have faced us as people in society and our norms across the world, some more ardently and aggressively than others, but still that change does happen. So either being alive or dead, I think that's going to be a thing of the past. And uh, these two choices will be looked upon as, as driving a, um, a buggy with two horses in the front by 2050. We'll look back and go, what, only life or death? Wasn't there anything in between other stages? The environments that we're currently coexisting within are not just the biosphere. We're coexisting also in this virtual environment. And when we say, well, due to the pandemic, we're doing more virtual Zoom, but it started beginning long before that. And in fact, Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. The medium of this interface with digitality has created a whole new philosophical outlook on how people communicate. The downside of that, as we very well know, is what I would call the death, the process of um, entropy or um, retardation or um, decay of social standards. And we see this within social media, how it has obfuscated a reasonable, critical, rational intelligence of society at large. So taking that and balancing that together is really truly essential in looking at the environment within which we live. This biosphere, protecting it and protecting our lives and all life forms is a responsibility. It's a necessary responsibility. Protecting the cyberspace that we do exist within in digital forms is something that we need to protect from that type of entropy or decay of consciousness and social uh, ethical standards. So putting all this together, I'm going to make an end point that it doesn't have to be death or dying. No one is asking for immortality. 
that term in and of itself is something I do not use because it's too associated with the lore of the past or even associated with um, Satra's no exit, you can't get out, you're immortal forever. That is not what those largely in the longevity movement are looking for. We are looking for longer, healthier lives for everyone, not just a few who can afford it, for everyone to reduce the costs of living longer, to increase the capabilities of medicines and practices so that it is deliverable through channels to the greatest population in the world, which is everyone. And that people do not have to die from old diseases that are still tormenting us today. So a person will not have just to choose between two options in this binary world of the past, but have multiple options as we seek new ways of being healthy in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very You're interesting. Very and I guess now we have our last one, Monica. Um, so Monica is a futures researcher with a specific focus on non-Western perspectives and a futurist and futures designer consulting and prototyping culturally expensive socially and environmentally engaged future worlds, world designs for the media industry, technology companies, and cities and countries. So Monica, what do you have to say? Oh, I think you're muted, Monica. Thank you so much. Uh, greetings from South Africa, uh, Johannesburg. Um, I just got here from uh, Tunisia, uh, red eye, so sorry if I'm a bit hazy. Um, I wanted to speak last because I wanted to connect some of the dots. Uh, I feel everybody else on the panel are, are very uh, specialized and, and, and focused on the subject of death or life extension uh, in their work. Um, whereas myself, you know, I have a great interest and I have a very strong personal experience uh, with it. Um, but I try to look at kind of a more of a global picture. And I think it's, it's super important to, to have both a sort of like zoom in and, and zoom out kind of view. Um, so, you know, one of the first things to start with, um, I want to say that when we talk about the future of the world in 2050, are we really talking about the future of the world? You know, or are we talking about the future of upper middle class, rich, predominantly white uh, people in few countries of the Western world, you know, is, is, is that the case? Um, you know, when we are talking um, about, um, you know, specific sort of cultural frameworks, we're talking about 2050, you know, we can never ever say what is the future. We can talk about the possibility space within, through our personal experience and perspective, certain things are more likely and certain things are less likely. And some things based on our current understanding of science, technology, politics uh, is entirely impossible. Um, I think whenever we talk about any subject, um, it is vital not to forget the larger context. Um, so my own work, you know, it really exists in the intersection of technology, culture, and politics. And none of these things exist without another. Um, as much as I deeply appreciate a lot of amazing technological innovation and scientific research that has happened in the world, whenever we just talk about science or technology and we do not think about cultural context in which it exists, um, you know, we start fetishizing technology. We start thinking that technology wants this or that or technology has agency of its own. Technology is but an extension of our biology. You know, these are just tools that we design and we use. So we have to speak about the cultural values that influence the design and the usage of these tools, right? Um, when, um, you know, when we are talking about any kind of innovation, we have to think about the political context in which it exists and how it could influence that larger political context. Um, so I think that's that's kind of my, my take on it. And I think, um, you know, very specifically with what's been happening this year, we are the closing chapter of 2020. Um, a lot of the think pieces were coming out um, earlier this spring on post-COVID world. Yeah. And at that time, I was in South Africa. 
And, uh, you know, obviously being on the continent, uh, the news flow um, is much more present. Oh, sorry, Monica, um, somehow you got muted again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so obviously what I, what I was saying is that, you know, being being on the continent, uh, the news flow of what is happening, the kind of realities that exist uh, for people, um, you know, in the townships, in the villages, uh, across all the different social spectrums, right? Because there's this, you know, the, the class divides are, 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 are massive and everything, all, all different types of lifestyles exist. Um, but you become much more acutely aware how so much of the discourse and how, how many of the think pieces were actually absolutely disconnected from reality. That we're speaking how we're all going to go and work virtual, where in, in reality, you know, majority of people in the world do not have access, not just to the kind of tools that we need to work virtually, um, but to the very basic connectivity, right? So, you know, I think these are very important contextual things to think about. Uh, and I really look forward to, to jump and talk uh, with, with the panel on the kind of consequences. If, if we speculate that this particular thing could happen, right? So I also happen to work uh, designing worlds on, on science fiction movies and TV series and, and been working a lot to, to challenge uh, the, the dystopia, uh, utopia binary and, and bring forth this new framework of protopia. So whenever you design anything in any kind of future, fictional future world context, a cinefire of anything, if people eat a particular food from a particular plate and they dress in a certain way, it implies a larger construct. You need to think, well, where that food will be produced, what this particular dress code tells me about the kind of character that this person is. And so whenever we speculate about anything technological being possible and even more so desirable in the future, we have to think about what is the larger context and truly global context, not limited to any social group, not limited to any racial fictional identifier. What does that really imply? So, you know, myself, you know, I'm, 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 I'm also uh, very personally connected to the subject of death. You know, I had quite a bit of a fight actually with my dad. Um, the other night, because uh, in my mid-20s, I happened to have an accident. I was so exhausted and I worked, I, I drowned in a hot spring in Japan. And um, I was saved by a extraordinary grace <laughs> of somebody noticing me as I was going underwater and basically kind of fishing me out um, after I was already uh, a couple minutes under. So now a matter of 30, 60, 120 seconds more, chances I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. So the fight I had with my dad was, well, you were actually not dead. Why are you talking that you were dead? You were not dead. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> for me, I was dead because I knew that that was happening and my body was switched off. I could do nothing about it. Right. So, you know, it's interesting, right, that kind of polemic that already happens within the very family of what is to be dead, what is to be alive, and how we cannot take for granted a possibility to be alive. At the same time, we do not exist alone. And however way we live and however long we live affects lives of others. And if we analyze what's been happening, even with this pandemic, with the kind of political views that are being endorsed by elder populations, with how elder populations are the ones succumbing the most for disinformation, how the funding of the right-wing politicians, the Tory government in UK, more money is being received by, from dead people than from the living, literally from the estates and the wills and so on and so forth. And those choices are deciding the lives of the youth. We have to take all these things into content. And I think that's the interesting conversation to be had, like always seeing the bigger picture and also understanding that none of this is an abstract idea. You know, having very firsthand, truly experienced, in my opinion, not in my dad's, what feeling that this are your these are the last seconds of your life 
what does that mean and how precious it is? I think none of these things are abstractions and we have to talk about it like real things are on stake. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this was a great start. We have very different opinions and views and very different angles to look at this issue. And I think that's exactly what we were looking for. Because um, if we're talking about the future, we got to think from very different um, ways so we can put them together and see what happens. Um, so now, to start a conversation, I want to ask a question that I know you've all of you talked a little bit about this, but it's more of a direct question. What do you think it's wrong with the way we died today? Who would I like to that? start? Yeah, please, you can I start. Like um, uh, well, let me actually give a little bit of a preparation to the answer because I think it's important. And um, as you say, we have a very diverse range of expertise here. There's often a danger uh, in such panels that, of course, we talk about our own areas and we reflect uh, each other's thinking, but the audience often hears an oversimplified version, an overly contrasting version. In particular, one thing I really think I want to emphasize for the benefit of the audience here is that we're all really thinking very alike in terms of what's desirable. So, for example, I think it's absolutely wonderful that Erica, what Erica's doing with her work and what Jillian's doing and that's completely compatible with the fact that I am working to put them out of a job, right? And furthermore, I'm quite sure that they are very happy that I'm working to put them out of a job and the sooner I succeed, the better. So really the only difference that we are reflecting here is a difference in each other's understanding of what's feasible, not really what's desirable. And that's quite important to recognize because a lot of people kind of go too far there. They will come to the conclusion that such and such a thing is so infeasible that we shouldn't even be thinking about it. We should be focusing on the here and now and not really going further forward. And that's very dangerous because of course what it does is it, um, it ignores expertise. You know, I wouldn't dream of pretending that I understand the specifics of how Erica or Gillian go about their jobs. And I'm sure they wouldn't think this similarly about me, but ultimately, um, you know, people do feel very comfortable coming to conclusions about what's feasible, even though they know that they know very little about the subject. And that sometimes frustrates me. So that led me to pick up on something that Monica said, a very specific thing early on in her remarks, which I thought was very, very important, that technology is natural. I think those were the words you used, Monica. Um, this is really important because a lot of people think technology is the antithesis of nature. And uh, you know we should leave aging alone because it's natural, for example. Whereas to me, that's the antithesis of nature. What's natural is that we have the desire and the ability to manipulate nature to our own ends, which is what technology is. So now, now, let, let me use that as a backdrop to come to my question, to my answer to your original question. Uh, you know, what 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 is, what is wrong with death? I think that's more or less what you said. Um, um, well, to me. I don't really think about that. That's not what gets me out of bed in the morning. What gets me out of bed in the morning is what's wrong with suffering. And the aspect, you know, the cause of, the one cause of death that I happen to work on is um, the one that causes the most suffering. You know, it's, it's the one that is preceded by the longest period of decline and decrepitude and disability and dependence and general misery. That's what I work on. That's what gets me out of bed. And the, you know, the fact that uh, there's this, you know, the, the more I succeed in postponing the health problems of late life, there will be this side effect that I'll also postpone death. You know, that's just a side effect. And it really isn't central to my thinking. And I don't think it should be central to anyone's thinking about this. This is just medicine. And medicine is unequivocally, you know, people don't argue about the, 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 the uh, desirability of medicine. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to answer? Anyone else? Yeah. What they think is wrong with the way we die today? I'll come in. First, I'm going to re respond to your last point there, Aubrey, about um, some people, that people don't uh, 
argue about the desirability of medicine. So in, in some of my research on end of life care, what's really interest, interesting is in one of our projects, which we're calling the forms of care project, we're looking at how people think about when not to have medical interventions, because at some time, certain interventions can actually end up causing suffering. So thinking about that avoiding of suffering. So it's, it's not that all medicine is, is inherently good because it, it, it can do certain things on the body and, and, and change life. There are times when actually interventions may may not be desirable so i think that's just one point and i for those who are interested in that work i, I would really recommend uh, sharon kaufman's book called ordinary medicine where she talks and presses us to think about where do we want to draw the line with medical technical interventions in in lives both as a society as well as an individual uh, people thank you erica let me just say i completely agree and i should have said medicine that works <laughs> Yeah, it's a good it's a good a caveat that <laughs> and I agree. Um, and then what I just wanted to then address the question that was sort of asked about what's wrong with the way we die today. Um, when I so it's like Julian, I do ethnographic research. I hang out with people who who are dying uh, as part of my job um, as an anthropologist. And what I see that what they find wrong or what's what's worrying to people is the mismatch between how they expect to be dying or what they expect the deathbed to perhaps be like and then what actually happens in terms of how intense the caring roles are that dying might might be faster or longer than um than what's happening um and so it, for me it's it's not that there's necessarily uh a right or a wrong way to die but it's that for as people are experiencing that mismatch between what they expect and what actually happens That was great. Anyone else want to join um, in? Yeah, I may, I may continue in there. Um, so I really want to echo what Jillian said in the very beginning that we sometimes really cannot even commence to talk about good death if we aren't really talking about what is good life or if many of the people living today, even in the wealthiest countries in the world, cannot experience what good life is, right? So I think that is very, very, very important. Um, and I think it's also very much related to how we put the unpleasant conversation, unpleasant experience out of sight, right? So we know that, especially in the Western world, you know, death has been made very much out of sight. I, I just read a wonderful book uh, from here to eternity by um, I'm afraid to mispronounce the name, Kathy Dottie, um, where she chronicles uh, and compares especially uh, experiences of death in in, in U.S. Uh, with um, you know kind of everywhere around the world. She, she looks into Mexico. She looks into uh, Bolivia. She looks into Indonesia. She looks into Spain. Um, you know, and the contrast that she's finding. And obviously, you know, having travel worked research in over 90 countries in the world, you know, I've witnessed that as well. And I think it's related uh, to larger uh, conversations also of, um, in a way, maybe I'm making a bit of a stretch here, but sort of the attitudes of toxic positivity. So this idea that, oh, bad things happened in the past, but let's just not talk about it. Let's just be pleasant and let's make peace now. But there is no such thing as peace without justice, right? And so in a way, I think it's hard for us to talk about good life if we are willing um, to try and camouflage the mortality, not just of our own selves and our own relatives and mortality that we cause, and specifically also what, what Jillian referred to um, of, of the kind of uh, racial injustice that leads to death, not of old, but sometimes very, very young people, including uh, you know, young boys uh, that are being perceived older, obviously, than they are. Um, and, you know, and uh, I, I think I this is the... mm -hmm. Sure. Let's have more of a conversation because I feel like each person's giving a separate talk and I really want to debate and discuss. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Monica. What you were saying was, was truly interesting and fascinating and I value it very much. I, I'm looking at the time and I really, there's some core issues that we need to get to. No, I think that's a great idea. I would like to see you guys um, talk to each other and discuss it. I, and, and with that point, I'm going to say something here. We ought not to politicize living or dying. And I think that's where, Jillian, I love what you were saying. Uh, it, very intriguing. And I agree with a lot of what you were saying, but I feel it was politicizing it, bringing in 
you know, some of the political turmoil that we're all facing, not in the Western world, but around the world. There's people who are suffering everywhere in the world. Well, and Monica's well, saying, well, you well, excuse me, can, I, can I address your point ahead, about sorry. that? I think mm -hmm. I'm just reflecting a reality. I don't think it's- Okay, then my reality is that death is really bad and let's not politicize it. The, um, but I'm talking about the lived experience of people that makes, if we talk about what's wrong with dying, this is part of what's wrong with dying. Let's and, talk and, also, I, I, and also, if, if I may, um, sorry, Natasha. Yes, go ahead. I'm <laughs> I sorry. Yes. I, 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 I think it's great we, we having this, this debate. I think it's, it's very, very important and it doesn't yes. often happen. Um, but, you know, I, I also didn't finish my thought. And, and my thought was the way we, we hide and we don't want to talk, we don't want to recognize death or mortality of our human relatives in the Western world. We also don't want to recognize our more than human relatives. And I refer to that as, you know, all life on earth, you know, it's not environment, it's not nature, is all our more than human relatives. And I think these things are absolutely related. You know, I think we cannot and we will not absolutely succeed in extending our life span unless we succeed in regenerating this planet. You know, I think I mentioned that in my there second is no, point ardently. There is, there, is, there, is, there is no magical cure, you know, for cancer if we continue living the kind of lifestyles and, and creating the kind of environments that are mm -hmm. absolutely leading us on a highway to death from cancer, right? So these things are interrelated. And our not just physical, practical, technological, medicinal relationship to death, but our cultural, social, and political relationship to death, and not just our death, but extinction of all life on earth and dying of all life on earth. These things are absolutely inextricable. And then, please, I'm sorry. Continue. Okay, we live in a synergistic environment. We're all part and parcel. Without one thing, the other doesn't exist. We need the bees, we need the bears. We need our planet to be healthy. This is a given. I mentioned that ardently in my second point when I talked about the environment. And I thought I expressed it uh, quite clearly, maybe not enough to get the point across that we don't live in a vacuum. Each human being does not live in a vacuum. And I only want to live and I only want my life. We are... Um, a, a biospheric family here, or cybersphere family here. So taking those conditions are important. And the key point I wanted to make is that we can't say it's one or the other. You can have your views and that's fine. And I can have mine. What's not fine and what is unethical is for me to tell you that, not you, Monica, I adore you. That is, has nothing with that. It's not one person telling the other person you are wrong. You're unethical. What you're doing is immoral unless it is coercively hurting someone else or something else. And that is within the synergetic system of all life forms on the planet and our solar system. That is a given. But if we're looking at what will death be like in 2050, I totally agree with Jillian and you that we have to protect what's around us and be aware of the socioeconomic, political understanding of every single person so that we can have an equity for all people to have opportunity based on their particular genetic makeup and their circumstances. Now, those circumstances are broad and wide in a socioeconomic system, and we don't have the time to break them down here. However, our point of this discussion is to look at what will death be in 2050. And I do agree with Julian that the practices that we have today will make for it at that time and that to respect the living and think about lives that are meaningful are important. So in that regard, we must pay attention to those whose life is not worth living or having hardships. I don't see anyone on the panel and certainly not Aubrey or myself who are saying we are proponents of not dying or slowing down the, the, the process of, of death and prolonging life through ethical use of technology and obviously evidence-based science. That doesn't mean it's only for a certain group of people. And if we want to branch that out and address the core issues that Jillian and Monica bring up, then we need to broaden the discussion here about sociopolitical issues. And that is up to our chairs to determine if that's what they want us to do here. 
Well, I believe um, each one of you has different expertise and sometimes for some of you, it's not the social political um, side of things. So it's difficult to have um, the, the, the precise content to talk about that specifically. But I think so it's do very- we, we break our tires for the people who are living longer and practicing um, uh, a healthy lifestyle because they're practicing a healthy lifestyle because their neighbor doesn't practice a healthy lifestyle. So how do you balance that out? What would you say to that, Julian? So um, can I ask a question regarding that then? Is that, um, so we're talking about that, I mean, is that our limit? Should we have a limit then to how much people live in order to have a balance between these two things? What do you all think? Uh, okay, absolutely not. No not limits. Unless, no, no limits. It should be a, per a personal choice in your opinion. In my opinion, I think that each person should own their identity, own their body, own themselves, as long as it doesn't hurt or destroy someone else with intention. Um, there are certainly byproducts that unintentionally hurt and harm other people, and those should be guarded very carefully because that's the good thing to do. And we want uh, to live in a good, healthy world of people doing good, kind things with a consciousness that is respectful of all the things that Monica and Julian mentioned that I may not agree with or think that are privy to this particular discussion, but I do agree with them that in order to get to 2050, we must pay attention to them. I, I don't, I'm not sure, um, Bibiana, if I really, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm understanding the question, but I think, um, you know, I, I, I think because of some of the things that I said earlier about issues of inequality and access and you know inclusion, I think the idea that that there should be some type of cap is in, it problematic. I think the idea of choice is problematic. Um, it implies that people have equal resources. Um, you know, I'm a fan of autonomy, of course, but I think it's very complicated to say you know to say that everybody. I mean, until we get to the point where everybody could have equal choice, you know, I think that that's um, that would be very tricky to do. Um, I think, you know, assumptions about, about health and healthy practices is also, you know, kind of tied up with, uh, again, you know, resources. And, and it's, I think it is driven by, you know, sometimes certain powerful people, you know, I think, um, so I think it, it becomes super, super complicated to talk about, um, you know, kind of who, who decides on limits and that type of thing. Can I, can I continue from there? Sure. Um, yeah, fully, fully agreed with, with Jillian. Um, and I, I want to, <laughs> I want to bring back and, you know, by no means, you know, Aubrey or Natasha, this is, you know, to attack you or in disagreement with you or anything. Um, you know, it's, it, it's my own perspective informed by the kind of research I've done and, and the kind of life I lived. Um, you know, and everything is political. <laughs> to say that, you know, we cannot politicize death, you know, or like technology is not political, or science is not political, it's actually not knowing the history of science or technology, right? Like technology is political, science has been political, science has been biased and guided by who, who and who's sort of whose desires, whose needs it had to serve. I mean, we know like, I mean, if, if we read anything about the history of science, you know, even, you know, I mean, I read so many books about science and technology and I keep seeing very prominent scientists, you know, use the age of enlightenment as something uniquely positive without ever recognizing that enlightenment brought, you know, <laughs> colonialism, you know, race, pseudoscience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we cannot say that we cannot politicize anything because everything is inherently political. And when we talk about life extension and, and death, you know, right in 2050, you know, we cannot also say that we're veering off subject if we're not discussing this particular life extension technology if we are talking about extending lives, we have to recognize that in 2020, in the US, and I'm not even talking globally, the pandemic has cost 
way more black and brown lives than white lives because of the social conditions, because of lack of access to basic medical care, but also because of environmental pollutions, because of the kind of jobs that people have, their lives were being cut short and they continue being cut short. So if we actually want want to talk about extending life, we have to talk about all of these things. And also we cannot disregard and and label as political discussion about the health of our biosphere whilst we're living through a collapse of a biosphere, because we know, if we know anything about where the bleeding edge of biological sciences is, is that we and the natural world are not two separate things. Right, the natural world lives within us. We are completely codependent to the microorganisms that live within our bodies and on our skin and within our orifices, etc., etc., etc. Not just for our basic health functions, but also our, you know, psychological states and and, and intellectual capabilities, etc., etc., etc. And that living world that lives within us is completely codependent on the health of a natural environment. So. <laughs> It is important to talk about the health of natural environment. We, we talk about the future of life and death in 2050. Because the fact that we're going to have this magical <laughs> life extending technology is not going to save us if we're going to have all these other conditions that will radically either shorten our lifespans by causing death um, you know, through disease or because it might lead us to, to, to global conflicts starvation, you know, mass migration movements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all so important Monica, conversations want... to have. Monica, I, I, I haven't said anything since Natasha spoke earlier, but I really want to emphasize that I do very strongly agree with what you're saying here, Monica. I think that the real thing that we haven't touched on yet is the importance of thinking at multiple different time scales. We do know, and this is really ultimately the reason I got into science when I was a kid, that over the long run, improvements in technology cause improvements in everybody's lives over the very long run. Nobody would dispute the fact that people's lives across the whole world are better than they were 300 years ago in terms of quality as well as quantity. But the distribution of that, especially on, on shorter timescales, is extremely non-uniform. And that is, of course, where politics comes in in a very big way. It's just that these two things must both be considered at the same time. If we let ourselves be distracted too much by the inequalities that exist and the bad decisions that some decision makers and policy makers make, then we may end on slowing down the overall rate of progress on the long term and hurting everybody in the future. And I believe that we as thought leaders in these areas have the responsibility to think about the future as well. You know, there's a reason why this panel is talking about the time 30 years from now. I think that if we work together, both those of us whose day job is focused on the future and those of us whose day job is focused on the present, we can have a great deal more impact on the benefit of, on, on the quality of life of everybody 30 years from now than if we ignore each other. That's really where, where I'm coming from. Yeah, I just want to add, uh, yeah, so it's been really interesting listening to this because I think I agree with, the, you know, my colleagues that have spoken about things are always political. That really does matter. It's, it's fundamental to all of our life. The personal is political, the political is personal, as we, we know. Um, and it's not an either or of these, these dichotomies. And I think as humans, we often want to put things into two different categories because that's a way of making sense of the world and how we can then progress forward. But I think when we are thinking about the future and, and trying to strive with our ambitions and push forward, it's really useful, as it's been mentioned by colleagues, to think about the questions that that poses and what does it mean for different groups of people as we're going forward and not to always just think, one way is the best way, because there's a multitude of, of ways that we can envision the world and that we have to be attuned to what we're listening to and also what we're not listening to as we go forward. So that's just what I'd add to that conversation. Thank you, that, Erica. That... There is a team rooting for you over here in the, in the chat window. It's quite lovely. I agree with you. And I'd like to say politicizing is different than political. And I agree 100% with Monica. Everything, everything is political. You can't get away from it. 
because of the definition of political. But there is a difference between political and framing um, through anthropological lore or looking at any history. Everything is political, but that is not politicizing. I mean, I think we uh, we might be um, sorry. I think we might be entering semantics uh, here, um, and I think some things might might be more crucial. And again, uh, Natasha and and uh, Aubrey, um, I think so much of the work that you're doing is fantastic, uh, and especially you know when I what I think about when I think about life. Uh, extending um, and life bettering technologies and, and, and medical science. I especially think of um, people with disability, right? I mean, that has to continue uh, to be the center of our focus, right? Like, are we helping people that are, you know, incredibly wealthy and want to keep living forever? Or, or do we really want to center and focus on, on health? I'm not saying that that's what you're doing. I'm saying that a lot no, of discourse not kind synonymous. of becomes perceived. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not addressing that to you. I'm saying that it's, yeah, it's very no, important to keep reminding ourselves that that you know when we are focusing all this inc extraordinary technological and scientific breakthrough, and we're centering communities of disability, we can do phenomenal things for our society. At I the agree same with you time, 100%. I want yes, to. I agree. Yes, but it, we're and all disabled. Time, I mean, we I have guess, to look at it that way too that we're all dying and that's a serious thing. Each one of us here probably has a disease that we know of or an illness that we know of or illnesses that we don't know of. And as someone who did get cancer from the environment, uh, I, I know firsthand what it's like to live in an environment that's unhealthy that caused my bladder cancer. But I'm not gonna hate the environment because of it. And I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not an advocate for, for that type of environment and anti-cancer because my focus is elsewhere. My focus is on the, the whole environment and all people. Um, so I, when we start getting into that politicizing, I mean, the elitist, the wealthy, the versus this, I, I, don't, I, I always get uncomfortable when that's part of the discussion because I am not wealthy. I have worked three jobs at a time and um, I've, I've, you know, I have been ill, I have been disabled. I just had surgery on a foot from a deformity. So let's not judge people based on that. I think that it's, we're good people here and all of us want the best for the constituency that we represent. And I think that's the beauty. I think Erica brought that forth in, in her latest statement. And if we look at it from then, then that higher level that we can get to here is how can we with our, as, um, Brianna was saying our, our unique differences and unique um, skills in our fields, how can we come together and resolve this to uh, dealing with some of those problems? Okay, if indeed certain people from a certain ethnicity are more prone to certain diseases, then let's look at that. Maybe the, um, the black community is more prone to diabetes. Um, maybe the white community is more prone to skin cancer. You know, it 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 goes back even to far, 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 far in history. Yeah, even. well, <laughs> oh there's some, several things that that need some some urgent uh, debunking. Um, I mean, okay. black community is not more prone to to diabetes. You know, these are social conditions, right? That that people cannot afford uh, healthier food. People live in food deserts and stuff like that. So this is very important to understand. And mm -hmm. then another thing I wanted to address, and you know, Natasha, again, you know, we cannot start like hashtag all lives matter, and I'm not disregarding at all. I don't think I know, did. The li the lives lived, matter. The li no, 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 no. But I cannot disregard the lived experience and the lived, you know, struggle and stuff like that. But we cannot equate you know, the, this, this, the, 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 the minor disabilities that we, many of us live with. Yes, um, as with I said, experiences. we each have illnesses and, and othernesses. Yes. True, but at the same time, there are people that have much more acute experience of disability, right? And, what and are we, we again, and my, my point, and my point is to center them in that conversation. I also want to address something very important because it, 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 it it remains very, very often unaddressed. Um, so, you know, it's very much a Steven Pinker view that everything's just getting better, but who is measuring what is better? Who is measuring what is better? If you look at it from the perspective of a lot of indigenous people of this world, right now, the life is not better. People actually have lived 
through the ultimate dystopia. And so for, for many of the people, 300 years might actually be much better. And we cannot disregard that view as just as a minority they're going to shove under the rug. And it's not to say that we are wrong and that there's nothing to be learned from what we're doing. Again, you know, my work focuses so much on the bleeding edge of science and technology. What I'm saying is that our science and technology will be better if we will keep centering the perspectives of people at the highest degree of marginalization. We will get our science and technology best for most of us if we will keep centering those voices that are critical, those voices that have been harmed, that have been hurt, that will lead us to create the kind of solutions okay, that will serve um, us all. Can I just interrupt I would... you all for a second? Um, this is a great discussion, but I just want to go back a little bit to something that everyone in the panel can discuss again um, so we can hear different voices. So I'm going to change the subject just a little bit. Uh, with a question for you all that is about, we've been talking about choices and the choice, if we had the choice uh, between living or dying and how we would uh, deal with that, right? And the option of you could choose one or the other, but how do we deal with this? Because uh, we're not very good at dealing with suicide, for example, and even people um, that's choose to die at a certain point of their lives when they're not feeling well enough and they feel like they their life is not worth it anymore we have a cultural problem with dealing with that so how will these choices if we have them will be dealt with are we going to accept suicide are we going to consider different options choosing not to uh, live is different than the suicide or how does that work in your opinion uh, could i start yes um please. So um, one kind of thing that comes up quite often in conversation about longevity research is that the assumption, which is very widespread, that if people end up living a lot longer as a consequence of staying healthy, then suicide rates will enormously rise. I think that's probably wrong because I think that today, the efforts that we make as a society to change the minds of people who are suicidal depends on our perception of their potential quality of life. You know, there's a lot of, uh, in the future, right? So th there's a lot of, um, you know, discussion, very legitimate discussion worldwide about euthanasia, but the overwhelming majority of that discussion revolves around people who are in an incurable, very low quality of life of one kind or another. Of course, not the, whole, not the whole conversation, but the overwhelming majority of it. Now, if people aren't getting into that kind of state anymore, or if people even are getting into it, but in a manner that is not believed to be permanent, then it seems to me that we're likely to work that much harder to change their minds. And in particular, if people who are already or are still in a state of youthful physical and mental health, however long ago they may have been born, um, then our attitudes to how important it is to change their minds if they're suicidal will come down to how much quality, high quality life they have ahead of them if they could only see it that way. And so, you know, we may try harder. I, um, you know, I've never rung a suicide hotline, but I'm fairly sure that when you do, the first question they ask you is not your date of birth so that they can put the phone down if you're over 75. Right. I, I have a feeling that suicide will, if anything, become rarer simply because we as a society will regard it more seriously as a problem. Um, I'd like to, to bring something, if it's OK, just because uh, Monica brought the indigenous uh, perspectives. And I know that Gideon has an um, uh, event about decolonizing death. I would be super interested to know more about this um, perspective and uh, for Gideon, how, we, how is it? Uh, how different perspectives on death and dying get through? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that for the, that particular 
event. It's focusing on disability specifically and, um, and death and this kind of concept of decolonizing. But I think the idea really is about um, other ways of knowing, other ways of understanding that aren't uh, maybe European and or white or, um, and so I think that there, it's kind of understanding that there are different death ways, different death practices that have value uh, and, and hoping, you know, that I think participants that, that engage in that uh, expand their, their thinking about what, what that looks like. Um, so that's a very, that's like a very basic kind of uh, description of that work. But I mean, I think what, um, you know, this kind of goes back to some of what I was saying in, in my kind of opening and introduction is that, um, you know, sometimes we only, we only we, our, our, our knowledge is limited to kind of what we've been told, right? And so, um, and sometimes what, what, what we have, what kind of knowledge we have access to is also limited uh, as an, a, and as a knowledge maker, you know, as an academic who's supposed to be creating knowledge, I have to recognize that I have one particular perspective. And so I'm trying to make sure that um, at least my work is, is more inclusive of, of different perspectives, different ways of knowing and believing. And I think um, that's, a, that's the, at the heart of that work on that project. I think it, it, to be more specific to the, you know, to disability too. I mean, I think that in some ways I feel like that is a voice that has been left out of the, of the conversation around end of life. And I think it kind of goes back to the question about even suicide. I think there's a difference between suicide um, you know, because people are depressed, right, and dying and dying and and want to die by suicide. And there's a different. And then there's a conversation about suicide. Um, you know, people ending their lives because they have serious illness, and it's an option in their communities, right? Um, so if you live in, like, I live in the state of California, and it is an option, right? If you have a terminal illness, and but but people from the disabled community have a lot to say about that, right? They have some some perspectives and. It is not necessarily a hundred percent, you know, embraced by everyone in the same way. And so it's it's that type of conversation that I I'm trying to have more of in my work. I, I don't know if that answers your hopefully that answers your question. If if I may if I may continue, Jillian, um, thank you so much. Uh, all points so 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 uh, needed. Um, not my place to, to speak about that, um, but there are amazing, amazing activists to follow. Um, I'll maybe single out one, Imani Barbarin um, on Twitter, um, is that have very deep conversations about that ableist bias of what life is worth and is not worth living, right? And for so many abled or very minorly disabled people, um, the notions of well, if I get this or that, or if I am not able to move or do these things with my body, then my life is not worth living and it needs to be commiserated or pitied. Um, you know, this is the entrenched ableist culture and, and we have to address that when we talk about, you know, good life and good death and, and things worth living. So thank you so much for bringing these points. Appreciate it. I, I just wanted to sort of respond there too. Is I think a lot when we're tasked about thinking about choice is and, and thinking about groups of people making decisions, we often try to homogenize these groups. And actually there's a lot, a lot of variety in what people think and also what they value. And, and going back to the question around choice and how we might deal with people making different choices is, is we'll have to realize that people are gonna value the same choice very differently and there are gonna be disagreements. We already know there are disagreements in families about how to manage day-to-day -day things. So things around life and death can cause tension and there'll be disagreements around focusing on the intention or the outcome, why someone did that, when, and, and the, the surroundings of the context of even those choices. So I don't think it'll be easy enough to just be like, well, we'll, we'll have these choices and we'll all be okay with it because we all can be positive about it. Is actually we're gonna have to contend that there are gonna be different ways of thinking about what is good, what is bad and what matters to people at different times and be open then to perhaps having conversations that are gonna be perhaps uncomfortable for us. Um, and so that's what I think is, is around that about how we might deal with it as society. I think what's also important to realize is that people's choices are often 
impacted by the things around them and they're not always aware of that. So we think about autonomy and choice and that we can, you know, oh, I can take in all this information and then make the decision that's best for me. But actually the information that I'm able to access is influenced by a lot of different things, including my privilege, my social ca cultural capital, the way choices are set out for me are framed by the person asking the question and that can psychologically impact what I think is the right answer, even if I might have different values. So choices isn't neutral in how they're made or how they're evaluated. So that's how I, I would go to the choice question. That's very interesting. Um, does anyone else want to talk about this subject? I, I just like to echo what, what Erica just said, because a particularly cogent example of what she just said is the question that the um, everyone except us is being allowed to answer right now, everyone except the panelists. Um, the way in which people are asked how long they would want to live enormously affects the answers that are given, enormously. Um, you know, whether you actually point out that you're talking about living in a fully functional, both mentally and physically state, you know, that kind of thing matters just like beyond belief. But also, people just completely ignore the fact that it's a stupid question anyway, whatever you say, because it's a question about a future about which you are entitled to change your mind in the meantime. I often like to say that it's, um, it's equivalent to being asked what time you want to go to the toilet next Sunday. You know, you may have an opinion about what time you expect to go because of habit, but having an opinion about what time you want to go makes no sense at all because you are um, going to be able to, you're going to have better information on the topic nearer the time, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of a crazy question. Yeah, we were actually going to ask if you could live well, <laughs> how long would you like to, but... Um... Uh, the, I think that would be a little bit better, but I totally understand what you're saying. And I um, think it is a tricky question in that sense um, as well. Um, so I guess I will not ask that to you. <laughs> um, I also don't know when I would like to die. Uh, <laughs> so um, let's go to a different question now. <clears throat> um, I want to bring... Uh, a quote from Brio Miller, who is the head of Futures Literacy at UNESCO, and who is one of the major reasons why we're having this event, why this summit exists. He has said that death is a loss and a gift. The quality of the compost we become is our only real legacy. And I want to know how you guys relate to this idea. Guess. <laughs> I think you don't agree with it. It's, I mean, it's extraordinary how people are willing to um, in, embrace such ideas. You know, I have plenty of time for the sociological concerns that come up in relation to the defeat of aging, whether it's the longevity consequences like the, um, you know, overpopulation question or whether it's the political questions like, you know, inequality of access. Totally. The only thing I don't have time for there is the fact that nobody seems to listen to the, the optimistic answers. Um, but the philosophical questions like, you know, doesn't death give meaning to life? I have no time for whatsoever. I think that um, these questions are just founded on a complete refusal to actually even define one's terms. So I think I'll stop there before I get angry. Does anyone else want to comment? I guess maybe just a very, very personal um, opinion of mine, N not as a futurist, but just as a person. Um, I honestly think we all live an eternity that is as long as is this humanity. Um, and the way we live that is that every action Every word, every conversation echoes through generations to come. So from the Indigenous perspective, we don't live a life of one generation. We don't live just our own life. We live life of seven generations. Because our life gives meaning to the three generations preceding ours. And we set the foundation for the three generations continuing from the work, from the, la the ground that we laid. And so I, I think 
you know, the, the best way to achieve immortality truly is to bring through our words, through our deeds, the kind of influence that could echo through that eternity, that could shift maybe the direction of, of humanity and hopefully uh, towards it being a more compassionate, a kinder uh, and more inclusive uh, kind of uh, civilization than it currently is. So <laughs> I think we all, honestly, we all can live eternally, right? Like everything, you know, in a good and in a bad way, right? Like every single thing that we do every day, we don't know who's the person that is serving us at the bar today. We don't know, you know, who's the, the Uber driver. We don't know who is that kid. We don't, we, we don't know. So we can, we can do so much in every single day of our life with every smallest and biggest action. And here, you know, goes my immense appreciation, especially for all of the educators that are bringing forth, you know, this, this new generation that op hopefully will not be afraid of difficult questions. Can you, can you, I, I agree with Monica, but as I'm like, guess I was so, I'm like kind of enraptured by your response. So I, I forgot the question. Can you, can you repeat the question, Viviana? Um, so I read a quote um, yes. from Real Miller that was, death is a loss and a gift. The quality of the compost we become is our only real legacy. And I wanted to know how you feel about it. You know, I, it's interesting because I, Prob it's probably true <laughs> for me because I'm not, can, I, I think the idea of legacy, I don't know. I, I don't really, I guess that's not what drives my, my life. My, you know, having a legacy isn't maybe the most important thing for me. So I think, yeah, my compost is probably the best I can do <laughs> in terms of contributing. Um, and you have me thinking also about, um, an organization in, in Washington state called Recom uh, Recompose where they, they are composting human bodies now. Um, and so, so I'm thinking about that too, when you say that. So for me, I, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that being my, um, my contributions probably in the day-to-day -day, like Monica's kind of describing. And um, if that's where it ends, it, it's, I'm okay with it ending with me. You know, um, if some of my ideas happen to, float around out there after I'm gone, that would be great, but I don't, I don't count on it. I'm, you know, not, I haven't written any great, great documents or anything that I think will live beyond me. So yeah, I think the compost is probably my best contribution. I, can I, can I disagree with that, Jillian? Yeah, please. I, 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 I don't, I don't know you in person, but I already know that your legacy through your students and so many people that you met, you. like, like, <laughs> please. Yeah, thank you. So I much I... <laughs> that you're giving into the world with your work that that will that will keep living on, and will become so many amazing things. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, so guys. Just, uh, oh, sorry. I think there was a legacy from the um, the physical and biological sciences. So it's an amusing thing actually that people who think about their legacy, and especially people who actually talk about thinking about their legacy, are very much looked down upon. Um, you know, it's, it's considered to be a rather undignified reason to get out of bed. Okay, so now, um, oh, Erica, you wanna, you wanna say something? Oh, I just wanna say something was really interesting about that quote in terms of focusing on compost as having legacies. It's something that's material and in this world, rather than thinking about afterworlds or other lives or also like the social elements that sort of Monica was, was attending to. Um, so I just think it just sort of attuning to the fact that it, the quote is pointing to regeneration of life in thinking about compost rather than the, the spreading or the ripple effect that I think Monica was thinking about or, or talking us through. I took it a different way. I took it as the compost of my memories and how they um, the maturation in my mind um, and how they um, turn and change and evolve and mesh and rework narratives um, based on what I see as, as my purpose in life. And so the compost is, is uh, regenerative. It's forever evolving and changing. Um, and I think just like with the the process of maturation itself in life, 
that we learn from our mistakes and change is difficult and understanding other people's views can be very challenging and difficult, but not to force our views on others and not to assume others have views that are adverse to ours. And I think that that memory bank can take that and coalesce it in beautiful ways as a compost. That's great. Um, so I would like to go for the Q&A now because we have a lot of questions from the audience. Um, I see we have a lot of questions from Money Money. And Carl, do you think we can um, uh, get uh, has a panelist so we can hear the question and see the face of the people that are going to be asking? Yes, we can please we can ask please. them to, to come to the panel. Let's find him. Ah, it's already there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi everyone. Yeah, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Caught you by surprise. Yeah, you caught me by surprise. Well done. Um, so some of my questions are... If you could just ask one, because we don't have a lot of time. You okay, can yeah, so one. this is a question to uh, Aubrey, actually. What are the uh, environmental ramifications of your work? Not in terms of uh, potentially what's going to end up when people live longer, but what uh, effect to the environment right now does your work have in terms of creating the actual medication and creating the, um, uh, the processes that, that are going to go on to prolong life? Like how damaging is, is it to, to the world uh, as, a, as a whole in order to make that progress? So there is an impact, but it's the opposite of what you were thinking. So um, actually one part of why it took me 10 years really to convince my scientific colleagues that the comprehensive damage repair approach that I pursue, it makes sense against aging is because a lot of the technologies I brought to bear on it come from other fields that had not previously been applied to aging. And that works both ways. So for example, one technology that is very instrumental to the defeat of aging is identifying bacteria that have unusual enzymatic activity, the unusual abilities to break things down that are hard to break down in the human body and therefore accumulate as garbage. And of course that technology is also useful for destroying recalcitrant material that accumulates outside of the human body, in particular in the environment. The, uh, the, the idea of what's called bioremediation, removing pollutants this way, is an established industry. It's been around for 40 or 50 years, but it could definitely do with a boost. And there are quite a lot of ideas coming out of bi the biomedical applications of that concept that are feeding back into the environmental applications. So for sure, the technologies that we're working on may very well have beneficial impact on the environment quite soon. Awesome. Um, I didn't. I didn't have an opinion either way. I, I was just uh, interested. But uh, also, I'd like to ask, what would be the final cost of it? And if everyone else can, like, kind of, um, uh, kind of chime in on that, in in terms of like, um, like, within society, if it's going to be affordable, if people are going to have access to it, because I think that's quite an. an sure, totally. um, and, that, and I'm sure everybody's going to want to chime in on that question. But let me go first, as you asked. And this is actually a question where. The people's, people's resistance to my optimistic answer frustrates me the most because the resistance is particularly unreasoning in most cases. So I'm very much hoping that my colleagues here on the panel will do better than average in that regard. So the real answer is that even though we see today a huge disparity of access to high tech modern medicine, uh, an expensive medicine, we will absolutely never see that in relation to anti-aging medicine. Because even if, even bearing in mind the very imperfect political um, machinery that exists in terms of distribution, the economic machinery that, that, that this revolves around will be decisive. These medicines, simply put, will pay for themselves so many times over, so fast, in terms of just avoiding the enormous expense that we have today as a result of the elderly getting sick, and of course also the indirect costs of the elderly no longer being able to contribute wealth to society, that there will, it will be economic, economically suicidal, even completely ignoring the humanitarian imperative or the electoral imperative, for any country not to make sure that the investment is made up front to make these medicines available, at, irrespective of ability to pay, to everybody who's old enough to need them. Now, of course, where we look globally rather than within a given developed country, the 
function is more complicated, but the ultimate logic absolutely still applies. And furthermore, this is a conversation and a, you know, a, a judgment that will be made in the decade or so in advance of these medicines coming to fruition. So everyone will be ready by the time they do actually arrive. Now, when I give this answer to most people, they think that I'm being utterly utopian, but nobody seems to be able to point out any actual flaws in the logic of it. Does anyone else want to answer that question? Otherwise, we'll jump to the next one. Okay, we have Lydia here. Um, she also has a question to ask. Yeah, well, actually, Gillian reached me out here in a direct message, and I'm, I was just trying to organize my ideas because I follow all of you, like, in a stalker way as a researcher, <laughs> and I've been researching uh, transhumanism since I, I don't know, for 10 years now. And this is something I try to organize in my mind as a researcher and as a human being, because if you see people like Ray Kurzweil and his documentary, and when he says that uh, some losses he had in his life were some kind of inspiration for him to research ways of extending life or uh, studying emerging technologies that would ultimately uh, extend life, would would it be possible to say that actually our problem is not about dying itself, but dealing with the reality of death and dealing with grief? So more or less what I wanted to ask. <laughs> I'll answer uh, um, because you did mention the area I'm involved in. Um, I, I think that any grief that we experience and just I'm not gonna talk about myself because Monica will scold me, but any grief that anyone experiences is a, an opportunity to learn. I mean, this is the psychology of, of dealing with grief and challenges. And we've faced one of the biggest challenges probably the world together has chased. And I hope not to use that word together too much, but we're all in this boat. And yes, some experience it more harshly than others, but the whole entire sociological grief that people are experiencing now and more passionate about those who are seem to be suffering more is where that grief is teaching us a big lesson about the entire international, cross-continental, cross-political, social, religious divides is that there is an inequity amongst people living on one speck of dust. And Carl Sagan wrote about this, and it was photographed from the, the, um, the mission leaving our solar system with a glimpse back at our solar system and that speck of dust that every person that ever was an innovator, ever had a challenge, ever had a hurt, ever grew, was ever born, lived on that speck of dust. And that we argue about these issues about what is death, what is dying, when the real issue, Lydia, is as you prefaced it, the experience of grief, that the person who's dead may not care anymore because that person is dead or in an afterlife or wherever one believes the person goes, but it's the person left behind that experiences that grief. So there's this holding on to life because we don't want the people we love to die. And that grief, did bring Pritzwell um, a realization that was bigger than his inventions of however brave and, and amazing his inventions have been. It's that simplicity of the human emotion of grief that he experienced that is synonymous with the larger picture of the world and how we treat each other. Thank you very much. Um, someone else was trying to speak. I'm sorry if I cut it. Um, well one of the reasons the question for me the, the question that that Lydia asked is really at the heart of of my work and my teaching um because I think uh because I'm not maybe because I'm not a, a transhumanist or I'm not doing I'm not engaging in in the research of, of helping people live longer um I I'm, tr I'm I'm trying to help people deal with what is what is the reality of now and so for me I am very committed to the idea that um, yes, I can't, I, I can't make, I can't, I don't think my goal of, of any of my work is to make death any less sad. 
but if I if but if I can set up students or or physicians that I'm working with to be able to have better conversations, more meaningful conversations and interactions before and and to make as Eric has been talking about making uh, the best and most informed decision for them, then I think that we can, I, I think what happens sometimes is that people can have some peace and some comfort when death does come. And, um, and so that's, for me, that is very much at the heart of, of what I'm trying to do, for sure. Thank you very much. We have now a question if, from if, Mary. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, can I? please. Of course. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, what I would say is that I guess the biggest problem that we have right now is is not so much uh, the overabundance of grief, but actually our inability to grieve, um, especially in the Western context, but actually that's been really spreading globally. Um, and I think, you know, a, a really, you know, huge elephant again in the room uh, is pervasive uh, ableism, not of any individual of us, but of our society, of our culture. Um, you know, modern civilization is permeated. Um, by ableism, as well as, you know, so many other isms, but I want to address ableism right now. Um, and um, what we've seen, especially, you know, over the, the course of 2020 is, is a spread of these uh, absolutely uh, inane conspiracy theories, which unfortunately led a lot of people uh, to a discourse where they're saying, well, you know, if somebody died, you know, they were too weak to live, or they did the wrong choices, or this or that, right? Whereas, the truth is that biology is much more complex than that, and we don't choose to be immunocompromised. You know, we don't choose uh, to, to do this and that. So I think it, it also, you know, what we've been seeing, this emergence of extreme callousness, which ultimately is a defense mechanism to our inability as, as a culture to vulnerably confront what a loss means. And uh, again, I'm going to go a bit of, on a limb, uh, but I might try to link it to, to this new emergent concept, you know, moving away from Anthropocene to Eremocene, which is related to, uh, to our longing, uh, realizing that we live in an environment that is becoming quieter and quieter by the day. You know, there's less and less of an insect sound, there's less and less of a bird song, you know, and, and we are becoming more and more lonely, not just individual, as individuals, each within our own bubble, you know, kind of trying to be so strong and, and tough and whatever, but also as a species, trying to be so strong and tough and, and controlling uh, rather than cohabitating. Thank you very much. Does anyone else want to say anything for this question in particular? Otherwise, I'm going to pass on to Meredith, who has a question for you. Okay. Oh, you, you're still on mute, Meredith. Could you unmute yourself? Thank you. Um, thank you all for your time. First of all, this has been uh, fantastic. Um, I would like to know how that we could give access to more marginalized cultures and people of the things that we're talking about with more immediacy. Um, death literacy, doulas, sort of like, would there be a way of, I suppose, relating it to, um, I guess, a planned parenthood for death and dying? I mean, I think I think the way that it's happening now is is uh, more fragmented. So it would be interesting to see something like that, like to see. I mean, some people have argued that there should be like death literacy programs, even in K through 12, like in the at least in the US, we have. Well, we should have more sex education than we do. <laughs> but but, um, you know, kind of the life, you know, as recognizing that it's part of the life course, you know, um, and so there have been lots of different, I mean, I've never heard anybody propose this kind of idea, Meredith, but I think it's an intriguing one, you know, that there would be uh, a mechanism, a council that would allow people to become more educated. Um, you know, and I heard, I know there's an organization that's working around issues of grief specifically in the US. Um, and, you know, they, they, I mean, they've been, I, th I'm, I was, I've been compelled by some of the work that they're doing because they have been observing that in, in the context of the pandemic anyway. In the U.S., where we have you know 260,000 people that have died, you know plus, um, as one stat that I heard from a public health expert was that there are nine nine people who are grieving. And when you start thinking about the exponential, I think to Monica's point about people who who are 
who need to grieve and maybe aren't grieving because they're having their essential workers or they haven't been able to bury someone or, you know, so on. I mean, we're talking about a huge, huge number of people who have no access to resources to help them, not to mention that they have had no education leading up to that point about, about some of the issues that we're talking about. So I think it's a really compelling idea. I don't know who's doing it though. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you, Jillian. Does anyone else want um, to say I think Erica? I just, I wanted to come in on that too. Is it, thinking about sort of the information people need to know about death and dying and grief is also, it's not always just about medical information. There's a lot about the social stuff and, and there's a risk sometimes that grief becomes medicalized as well for people. And, and some of that struggle of not knowing how to grieve is actually not knowing how to grieve in your social networks and how to how to display grief, do grief together collectively. So I think some of that education that sort of Jillian's pointing to is actually as societies talking about death and dying and grief and, and working with each other to articulate what are the types of things that are helpful or not and, and how we do memorialization, for example. And that that's come a lot to the fore during this pandemic because of the high death rates and also just the media telling us every day about death. Um, but also it, it's been a long time coming in terms of some of that death positivity that's that's been happening for the past few decades. I'd like to just add on to um, Erica. Uh, you know, it's interesting talking about grief and, and dying and what about death with dignity? What about those who are in positions where they're the left in um, assisted living or in hospice and you want so desperately for them to just pass on because of their state, they're no longer there with dementia or um, usually a dementia because um, Stephen Hawkins showed us you can still be active with your mind active, but without the active mind, there is a problem. And so with the, in the United States, the way the medical system is run, you have to stay alive. Um, on morphine, and it's a, a tragic, terrible thing. I've spent the last three years in hospitals um, watching this and um, assisted living hospices, and it's, it's horrifying and tragically sad, but there's nothing you can do. And every time I talk to a doctor, isn't there anything we can do? And the bottom line is no, there is nothing you can do. You have to wait until they've had their final breath. And so I think that if there is to be any type of assistance, um, a play on pl planned parenthood, a planned death, planned um, experience of grief, and to um, hopefully one day, in my view, um, we'll be able to allow people who want to die to be able to die, whether it's through assisted living or death with dignity or um, euthanasia. It's um, certainly a choice that could have helped many people and hurt others indeed. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll go to the next question from Sebastian that I hear it's actually James. Hi, can you hear me? I've just unmuted. We can hear you, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, the connection went down a bit, so I don't know if what I'm going to say now is sort of completely off piece, but I, I, in a way I was trying to get back to the original question about 2050 and mm. I was thinking as everybody was talking is 2050 uh, a, a sort of an arbitrary date uh, uh, too too soon for us to be t talking uh, projecting these ideas forward is 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 30 years uh, enough time for us to be talking about the things that we have been talking or you've been talking about or do we need to be projecting further into the future Um, let me say a word about that. I believe that actually it's rather dangerous to focus too much on the future, even as far as 30 years away. That's, that would be about my limit because of the exponentially increasing um, contribution of unknown unknowns to how life is going to be. You know, uh, some people say that my focus is too, too far in the future and it's generally, you know, less than 30 years. Um, and I certainly believe that, for example, um, when people raise questions about how the world would be in 2100 if we didn't have ageing starting in 2035, um, they are not really focusing on what they should be focusing on because there's so much that we don't know. 
if we look back even 20 years ago, you know, the internet was more or less unthinkable. Um, you know, so, so I, I, I'm in favor of focusing on the medium term and the near term, but really not the long term. Thank you. Does anyone else want to? Natasha? Okay. Yeah, as, as a futurist, a practicing futurist and an academic futurist, I think 2030 and making predictions is the wrong thing to do. I mean, so many times it's kicked people in the ass. Um, you know, why would anyone need a personal computer? Um, a computer will never weigh less than a ton. I mean, you know, you look at all the predictions over time and they've always proven themselves to be silly. And then the ones with the, the true visionary ideas that were the first place holders that were laughed at and hit the curb and told that they were, you know, elitists or um, troublemakers or whatever, they end up being mainstream within X number of years. Um, and then everyone forgets them. They're left behind and you have newness going on. And all this is part of the rhythm and flow of, of evolution and thinking and technology. But I agree with Aubrey here that 2030, is, I mean, 2050 is a ways off. And look what's happened in, as Aubrey said, the, we didn't have the um, internet in the 1990s. We had the World Wide Web, if you all remember. And uh, so, so much has changed. So much has changed, but I think now with that said, nanomedicine is right on the cusp. It was like narrow AI was some decades ago, right when Marvin Minsky was at MIT and the neural networks weren't happening. And then all of a sudden it happened through narrow AI. And now we're seeing AI growing by leaps and bounds. It's still a narrow, but machine learning has come from that. We're still nowhere near our artificial general intelligence, but it's heading in that direction, which brings a lot of problems in and of itself. But looking at the human body and biology, it would take nanomedicine to really cause the shifts that I envision. And the, um, the advances in um, anti-aging or mitigating aging um, scientific protocols that SENS Aubrey is working on. But um, I think that when I started this conversation, I took 2050 seriously. And I address that point on. And I think that in looking at the, the tone and tenor of this, of this discussion, it is not about 2050. It's about um, what we feel and think. Thank you very much. We don't have a lot of time, so we are going to have to end the questions now. I'm sorry, uh, Roland, we were going to have your question, but we won't have the time for that. And I wanna thank everyone. Um, this was great. Um, I hope I did a good job um, and I hope everyone was comfortable with everything that was discussed. Um, it was a pleasure to hear all of you, um, really interesting ideas from everyone here. Um, and I'm gonna pass it on to Carol so she can say goodbye to all of us. Thank you very much again. I don't have Thank much you. to say. Thank you, everyone. It was a very rich uh, discussion with many different um, approaches. And yeah, thank you, everyone. That's all I have to say. Uh, I'd just like to say if, uh, if anyone, I don't know if I speak for the rest of the panel here, but if anyone wants to send me any questions that we didn't have time for because I have intrigued you or infuriated you, then um, you know, please feel free. I will put my email address in the chat. Thank you, that's great. Anyone else who wants to, to do that, please, um, the chat is open. Um, it would be great to have these conversations going and um, hope we can all think more about that. <laughs> thank you. And I just wanted to thank you also for chairing this conversation because it's not always easy doing this online. So thank you for doing that and inviting us all to have this conversation together. And thanks everyone thank who's been so engaging much. by watching, listening and typing away. It, we really appreciate your energy and your, your um, being with us tonight, really. Thank you so much, everybody. Also extending the thanks. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Bibiana. Thank you so much. Okay, we're all going to go now. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend, everyone, wherever you are. Bye. Bye. Oh, I guess someone is asking how to save the chat. Um, there is an option, I think. I don't know. Atur, can you tell us how we save the chat? Or someone from more the technical side?
I'm not sure. I'm sorry. But uh, I think we're going to send an email to uh, everyone, to all the attendees to... Uh, a, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, there's an option in the chat. There is the three points. And you can save the chat. Now, if you go to the chat box itself, you'll yeah. see three dots at the bottom. The three dots. That might only be open to us as hosts and panelists. Yeah. And okay. you might want to check before you circulate it to everyone. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. So we're going to save it and we're, send a, we're going to send an email to all the attendees with uh, links and emails and things that were mentioned here. Um, so I hope uh, this is what you were looking for. I don't remember who asked this question, but um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, everyone, again. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.